Then, in chapter 7, the day of the wrath of God, an end is coming, the day is near, it's coming shortly. I just refer back before we move on to 7 8, chapter 7, verse 8. I will shortly pour out my wrath on you. The verse before says, Your doom has come to you, O inhabitant of the land. The time has come, the day is near. And verse 8 says, Now I will shortly pour out my wrath on you. Interesting. You can say it's come, it's arrived, meaning it's about to come. This is very important because Jesus opened his ministry with these words when he said, in Mark chapter 1, 14 and 15, and you can write to Dr. MacArthur, John MacArthur, please do that. He has much good stuff, but he doesn't quite get the point that you're supposed to believe the gospel as Jesus preached it. He comes very close to it. He just needs to be urged a little bit in that direction. Why not start with Mark 1, 14, 15, where Jesus used this language of Ezekiel, really, and said, the kingdom of God is at hand, meaning it's about to come. Get ready, because there's only one thing that matters in your future, that is, where will you stand when that kingdom of God appears? Are you going to be in or out? Get ready, get prepared for the coming day of the Lord. It's coming shortly. Yes, it's 2,000 years, we know that. And Peter then has to step in and say, a day is like a thousand years with God. I get that in Second Peter. But it's always close because you or I could die at any moment. We're not immortal yet. And then the next moment of our consciousness after the sleep of death has intervened, we're facing the judgment. So it's never time to hesitate or to doubt or put it off. The time is near, it's coming shortly. And the point will be that in the end, through all the tribulations that are mentioned there in that chapter 7, the end result will be that the people of Israel will know the Lord. They'll get to know the Lord through that time of trial. That's the background then against which Jesus preached all this stuff. Now we're in chapter 8, so I'll read 8.1. And the title here in my NASU, New American Standard Updated Version, with marginal references, always by the one with the side margin references, says this in 8.1 of Ezekiel, to do with strength. Ezekiel has to do with, Chazak is the Hebrew for strong, Ezekiel is a strong person, right in his name. It came about in the sixth year, on the fifth day of the sixth month, as I was sitting in my house with the elders of Judah, sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell on me there. Then I looked, and behold, a likeness as the appearance of a man. From his loins and downward there was the appearance of fire, and from his loins and upward the appearance of brightness, like the appearance of glowing metal. Then I saw something that looked like an arm. The <coughs> arm reached out, grabbed me by the hair on my head. <coughs> then the spirit lifted me into the air, and in a vision from God, he took me to Jerusalem. He took me to the inner gate, the gate that is on the north side. Yep. The statue that makes God jealous is by that gate. Yes. Um, verse 4. Suddenly the glory of the Lord of Israel was there, just as, just as I had seen it before in the valley. Verse 5 says, Then he said to me, Son of man, raise your eyes now toward the north, so I raised my eyes towards the north, and behold, to the north of the altar gate was this idol of jealousy at the entrance. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing, the great abominations which the house of Israel are committing here, so that I would be far from my sanctuary? But yet you will see still greater abominations. So I went to the entrance to the courtyard, and I saw a hole in the wall. He, he said to me, Now, son of man, dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and uncovered a door to a hidden room. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations that they are committing here. Verse 10. Uh, so I went in and looked. I saw statues of all kinds of red tiles, animals that you hate to think about. The statues were the filthy idols that the people of Israel worshipped. There were pictures of those animals carved all around on every wall. Mm -hmm. 
Eller hvad? Eller er det den? Eller er det? 70 leaders of Israel were standing there with Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, in the middle. Mm. Mm. Each of them held an incense burner, so there was a thick cloud of incense above their head. 12 says, Then God said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark? Each man in the room of his carved images and they say the Lord doesn't see us the Lord has forsaken the land and he said to me yet you will see still greater abominations which they are committing so you might say well what has this got to do with us today I leave your imagination to run a little bit can you imagine a church setting where there are all sorts of images where a goddess is being prayed to is that a conceivable possibility among your friends? What about then images of Jesus, pictures of Jesus even? I doubt if that's exactly what God would want. I, I've seen the Urban's verse in Scripture. I think we need somebody to research a little bit some of the buildings we look at as we drive down the road. What is that steeple about? What are the signs then of the churches of our day being other than paganized? You can refer to... Keegan's book, The God of Jesus and the Light of Christian Dogma, and much of our own writings, and many church historians. Harnack, for example, very famous. Harnack, Loofs, we've written about them in, in our books. They know that something went wrong with the faith from the second century. They started relying on Greek philosophy, Plato, in fact, who was in favor of homosexuality, somebody could do a research paper on that too, all sorts of paganized influences swept into the church and most people have not learned about that. They show up dutifully to church week by week by week. They don't know where some of those doctrines came from. Are they liable then to fall under the disapproval that is expressed by Ezekiel here in view of what they were doing in Judah some 500 years before Christ even? So, I invite you to offer any comments you have on that section. I don't want to spend too long on it. These are very abominable things. The word abomination is a bit of a euphemism, I would tell you. The Hebrew means disgusting. These are things that, things that are revolting to God. And of course, it immediately reminds you of the abomination of desolation. So all of this has relevance to Jesus' long discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, his long discourse about the events that must happen before the second coming can occur. So you may have friends in the Jehovah's Witnesses movement where they said that the second coming was in 1878. I want to tell you that that is a death penalty crime. You don't go around setting dates because you get people all disturbed and perturbed and they said, well, the second coming was invisible. It was in 1878. And when that failed, they said, well, we were wrong. It really was 1914. This is a death penalty crime in the Old Testament. God is not impressed with that. You start announcing dates which fail, you're dead. Now, God doesn't execute that punishment now. And that's part of our problem. It's in, in Ecclesiastes 8.11, I think, it says that because sentence is not executed... Is that, did I get the right verse? Is he, uh, not is he, Ecclesiastes 8.11. Ecclesiastes... 8.11. We need to use that one very often. Sarah, could you read that verse for me, please? Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the son, sons of men among them are mm. given fully to do evil. Yeah, the common English Bible be best captures yes. the condemnation for wicked acts yes. is not carried out quickly. Right. That's why people dare to do evil. Yes. Mm. Common English Bible. Yes, not only the condemnation of it, but the execution of the punishment is not carried out. I mean, a lot of people are condemning these things, but God doesn't strike you dead. Talk about this just for a moment. In the book of Acts, do you know what happened when those people, Ananias and Sapphira, I refer to it, you know this story. Well, they sold a property and they lied about how much they got it for it. This is not too long ago, 2,000 years ago. And in front of the apostles in Acts, they died. When they lied to Peter, 
The man, first of all, fell dead. Later, his wife came in, told the same story, told the same lie. She collapsed and died. Are you hearing that? Wow, what sort of a God are we serving here? Later on, Paul was on the island of Cyprus and he met Sergius Paulus. And there was a certain Elimas or Bar Jesus, a false prophet there, who kept interrupting Paul, getting in the way of what Paul was saying to the good governor there. And Paul turned on this man. He said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you crooked so-and-so, you're going to be blind for three days. We don't have that sort of power now. If we did, we'd better use it carefully. But my point here is that God is not joking about his insistence on getting God and Jesus defined right. So bear that in mind. There's another occurrence in the book of Acts, three or three of them altogether. The third one would be this. Herod got up and gave a sermon, gave a big talk. He put on royal robes and sat on a throne and he was struck dead because he didn't give glory to God. Is that the guy who blew up? That he swelled up and... No. This is Herod who gave a talk and he died in the process because of arrogance that's uh, in Acts. So there's three examples there. Ananias and Sapphira, the example on the island of Cyprus, and this one about Herod, the king. Yeah. Can I yes. go back to... Please. What was your original question in terms of how do we apply this to us today? Well... When we go around and look at the churches yes. and so on. Yes. Was, was I that suspect, the question? My, I, I would suspect there's a lot of yeah. paganism there. Well, my question but was... Somebody can write up on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just speaking to that, what yes. you just said. Yeah. In verse, uh, where is it, 13, mm -hmm. uh, here in Ezekiel. Yes. What's it say? Sorry, I don't have it. 8.13, he said to me, yet you will see still greater abominations yes. which they are committing. Mm -hmm. uh, no, sir, when it says they say... Um, sorry folks sorry I just cut out there um, in reference to it seems to me that throughout the Old Testament mm -hmm. Whenever there was paganism, idolatry, whenever the people strayed from God yes. into this stuff, yes. they knew, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. they knew, people knew, okay, well, they said here, well, God's gone, let's mm -hmm. do this. So, mm -hmm. But we're, we're in a situation now, mm -hmm. is this true or, or yes. not, that yes. if you go into the places that we mm -hmm. think are pagan yes. in some respect, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and you confront mm. the leaders mm -hmm. or the people it's a different it's a wholly different situation because mm -hmm. they don't even know what you're talking about mm -hmm. then they, they they actually turn and go what are you talking about? you're the you're the heretic yeah, of yes so you see what I'm, when we try to apply that to today it's a situation much more braver, is it not? Because people don't even know. When you say, did you know that Christmas is pagan? Mm -hmm. And they're like looking at you and say, oh, you hate Christ. Yes. Or you, of course you, it's you don't believe in the virgin yes. birth. But you have to press on. My point is so that what has happened is nothing's why? happening because people are not confronting. We would not be standing here talking to you today. If My point is keep... that the people... Yes are so now ingrained yes, of course, in yeah. it that they don't know. No. So when you point to the idolatry, yes. what you think is idolatry, mm -hmm. to the windows and the steeples and this, they go, what are you even mm -hmm. talking about? But some don't. You have to go on saying it anyway. And we know from our experience that there are people out there who are thinking. Of course it's difficult. It's very difficult, but the command that we are to preach the gospel in the whole world still remains. Ezekiel was told exactly that, the people are going to be very hard-hearted, very stiff-necked. They're going to have foreheads like adamant. We use the word adamant. Apparently adamant is actually a, a sort of a stone. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult. So you're absolutely right. It is hard. 
But if we don't say anything, then the blood no, is on us. No, my point is, yes. is not hard, or is it hard or soft. Mm. My, my simple point is mm. one of the situation is totally different than yes. what Ezekiel and the prophets mm -hmm. encountered. Mm -hmm. Back then, mm -hmm. they have, and Moses, you know, Moses comes down and goes, hey, stop committing idolatry. Yes. They go, well, we thought you were gone and right, forgive us. But now it's a situation yes. where the it, it's in their blood. Of course it is. It, it's in great it's in the it it's in the structure of the buildings, it's, it's in the system of their bodies. Yes. And they just look at you yes. with a quizzical look and go, What are you even talking about? You sound like a heretic because you don't believe yes. Jesus is God or you don't believe yes. in the Holy Mary and uh, whatever right. and blah, blah. you see what I'm trying to say? Well of course I see that, but what difference does it make to you? You have to go and tell him. It, it, my point is, we're, we're yes. trying to apply yes. this yes. Ezekiel to yes. today, but it's totally non-applicable. No, it's very much applicable, because you have to go on saying it, and we are winning some. It's maybe harder, of course, but it's the same principle exactly, because if some kind person had not changed our minds, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. So when you say they are doing that, that's largely true, it's very difficult. But there are some who are seeing exactly well, what that, that's why we that's why we I think we yes. agree that that when someone yes it, that's why it's such a miracle yes of course that yes. when people actually some people sort of wake up yes and go wait a minute yes I am in in, in this situation that yes. I believe is is not biblical yes i.e pagan that's why it's such a huge miracle. I mean, we're always after the char charismatic stuff. Mm -hmm. But that's the biggest miracle that in, in this situation of such ingrained in your blood paganism of course. that people are still waking up yes. somehow. But not and somehow, it's by a miracle of God. So that's exactly what I say to them on the phone when I immediately try and get on to these dear people. Mm -hmm. I say, you're a miracle. How come you're not shaking your fist at us? <laughs> That's a miracle. I, I fully grant that it's very, very much more difficult now, but the principle applies to us exactly the same as far as I understand it. There's a place where Paul says that now that he's in prison, he's writing for prison, the people in the church are more emboldened to do something with the gospel. That rather implies that, implies that Paul is a solo guy. You get the fact that Paul is doing the whole thing, but Paul himself said, now that I'm in prison, on one occasion, in Philippians, I think, the people are more emboldened to speak the gospel because I'm not there doing it all. Otherwise, Paul seems to be operating almost solo a lot of the time. Well, I, I yeah. would argue once again, I don't want to be a contrarian, but mm, that's all right. it's a situation when, when we do wake up, mm. uh, we don't go on to do that. What, what we're we doing do. now as a group is right. fra fragmenting. Yes. Because then we, people go their own ways within our own like-mindedness. Well, sometimes it, and we're sometimes not together. It, and then we have to get that Instead together. of saying what you just said, yeah. yes, let's go boldly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Did you find the verse? Mm -hmm. one, Philippians 1.14. Thank you. Can you read that verse? Most of the brethren, yes. trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to Speak the word of God without fear. Yes. That's right. 114. Yep. Paul, you remember in Acts 17, 17, was in the marketplace, I take it that's today the internet, he was in the marketplace lobbying people, just stopping them, talking to them, engaging them, because he realized that they needed the truth to be saved. So yes, it's very hard. The principle is exactly the same that we have to face a very antagonistic world, and that's what we're trying to do. So Keegan can perhaps, as a historian, can tell us more about the paganization of the buildings and so on. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff there. There is the book called The Two Babylons by Hislop. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but it's a subject that we can try to investigate. Can I go on to read the following verse? Yes. Philippians 1, <coughs> 15. So he says that. That's lovely, right? But then some, to be sure... Yes preach Messiah out of envy and strife, yes. <laughs> but others from the right motives. Yes. These do so out of love, yes. knowing that I am appointed for the defense yes. of the gospel of the kingdom. Yes. The others yes. proclaim Messiah out of rivalry, 
with the wrong attitude, yes. seeking to cause me trouble yeah. in my imprisonment. Yes. Well, we hope that that will not be reproduced today. Some are doing it from the best motives. Others are doing it out of jealousy, rivalry. Heaven forbid. But Paul then is realistic. He says within the church that he knew, there are people who are doing this for the wrong motives. That's awful. Even then. But he, Even was, he was happy. He says, yes. what then? Only that in every yes. way, whether in pretense or in truth, Great. Christ is proclaimed. Huh. And Good. in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So it was still the true Christ, which is not the situation today. That's right. It was the wrong motives, but well, it was yes. the, actually the true gospel. Yes. Uh, can I just share some comments? Yes, some please. I'm, Sorry, glad, I'm glad. This is good Bible study. Okay. Yes. What, what are they Randy, uh, mm. to go back to the Adonai thing, mm. uh, glad to see there are a few translations that have lowercase l. Yes, that's true. E -E -E -V, yes. J-P-S, yes. N-A-B, N-E-T. Yes. That's more than a few, right? Wow. NIV, yeah. NRSV, yes. RSV. Okay. Good. Um, Good. Thank you, Randy. Dan said, flags in church, comma, uh, question mark, I wonder who or what we worship. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, Daryl says, because the, the AME thing, the AME thing is going on in Virgin Mary, Oh, yes. The God Jesus some belief, the cross is worshipped by many. Yes. Angels are worshipped and prayer is given to them. Many different forms of idolatry. That's right. Uh, Samuel Sorensen, mm -hmm. Acts 743. Mm -hmm. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle yes. of Moloch mm -hmm. and the star of your God Remphan. Remphan, yes. Figures which ye made to worship them and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Yes. Same um, principle. Dan says, Trinis do not realize they are idolaters. Mm -hmm. He said it. Randy, the ISV has where an image that provoked God's jealous anger mm -hmm. had been erected. Yes. That's um, right. Bob and Kay, sorry. Is yes. It, uh, Exodus 25, mm -hmm. 20 yeah. verse 5. Mm -hmm. Maybe the answer about jealousy. Mm -hmm. uh, God's jealousy. Yes. That was a question from Michelle, mm -hmm. wonder what the idol of jealousy in verses yes. 3 and 5 mm -hmm. are. Or, or I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't say, and the commentators can only guess, but it gets a little bit more express in verse 14 of our chapter, 814, then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, the temple, which was towards the north, maybe next week we'll have a map of the temple, you can look at the building exactly. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Well, Tammuz is obviously a pagan god, and these women are weeping for Tammuz. That same Tammuz shows up later in a Greek dress as <coughs> Aphrodite or Adonis. So what happens is that these gods and goddesses change their names, but they always show up eventually in a paganized culture. So I must mention to you, Mary as an intercessor, as a mediatrix, and that's the word, mediatrix, T-R-I-X, between God and man, is very pagan. So you say to your Catholic friends, and we're meeting some of them whose eyes are being opened, very gently, you say, do you know Mary actually is dead? You might be wasting your time lighting candles to a dead person, I wouldn't go there. And some people say, my goodness, you're right. And they're doing it, so when they phone us, or I phone them, I say, you are a miracle. What? I'm not a miracle. Yes, you are. You're a miracle. How come you are seeing that God is one? You've ceased going to the Roman Catholic Church now, because they're not teaching you these truths. So it's happening. Carlos is absolutely right. It is very difficult. God knows that. Jesus knows that. But we have to persist. We cannot give up, because it's very difficult. So I'm glad we got to that passage in Philippians. That's wonderful. Ryrie says, perhaps the idol of jealousy is a replacement of the image of the goddess Asherah, yes. originally set up by King Manasseh and subsequently destroyed by Josiah. Yes. Is that the Easter? Yes, that's where we get Astarte, and we get the word Easter Asherah? from that. Asher is the yes. Easter goddess. Yes. Well, Tammuz was the husband of Ishtar. Yeah, got it. Ishtar, yeah. Yes. Who, after his death, supposedly, be supposedly became god of the underworld. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some yes. have understood him as a vegetation deity, mm -hmm. dying in the heat of summer and rising in the spring. Yes. 
Remember base that. immorality was connected with his worship. Remember that in Easter coming up? Yes. Yeah. Yes, this famous Astarte comes in the margin of the New American Standard Version very often, and it's a female goddess, an image of a female goddess. Well, think around of your friends now. Do you have any who might be possibly worshipping a female goddess who actually is dead? That's not doing them any good. So you get alongside in a very gentle, clever way, you suggest that they might want to examine that. Or worshipping a dead, resurrected God. That resurrected God. Yes. Still a pagan, if it's not the real Jesus. So what has happened is that they have made, the world has made an idol out of Jesus. Can you imagine that? He's the biggest idol. He's the biggest idol ever. He's become the biggest. Most of the best commentaries say Jesus never claimed to be God. He never claimed divinity for himself. And yet we should somehow believe that he's God. The thing is to engage this conversation with the local newspaper. I'm currently writing to a very learned evangelical friend in England, I've known, and he's um, coming to think about this for the very first time in his life. I don't know how this will turn out, but we must get them to see that the Shema, the hero Israel, is the commandment, and you warm the subject up this way by saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yes, we all love that. Well, excuse me, then how about starting with the greatest commandment? What does that one say? So we are currently, in fact, Carlos today received a nice answer from somebody in Spain, a learned uh, theologian who said, the Shema is a unitary monotheistic creed, it's not a Trinitarian creed. What if we're not getting that first commandment right? That could be very serious. So let's engage the public, let's get the conversation started, and then people will say, my goodness, I better look more carefully at my Bible. Can I share quickly? Please, go ahead. No, I like the interaction. Uh, uh, Romans 1. Mm. Jesus has been made into the biggest yes. idol. Yes. Romans 1, uh, 18. God's righteous displeasure, mm -hmm. this is your translation, yes. that the world is revealed from heaven against those who are godless, not in right standing with God. Yes. What can be known about God is obvious to them because God has made it crystal clear to them mm -hmm. ever since the creation of the world. And God's invisible attributes are seen through creation. Yes, of course. Such people, therefore, are completely without excuse. Mm -hmm. Because even though they knew God, so we know God in, through creation, mm -hmm. they did not glorify Him or thank Him, but instead their arguments turned into stupidity. Yes. Darkness filled their empty minds. Verse 22, even though they claimed to be wise, they became foolish idiots. Mm -hmm. And 23 is the interesting one. Yes. When it comes to Jesus as God, uh, yes. absolutely, yes. they exchange the glory yes. of the immortal God yes. for idols, yes. images of mortal mm -hmm. human beings, yes. birds, animals, yes. and reptiles. We had that very thing here, didn't we? Paul had that passage in Ezekiel about the creeping things back in verse 10. Right? Verse 10 of chapter 8, the one so, we're doing. So yeah. once again, mm -hmm. just to make this cl cl uh, crystal clear, as mm -hmm. you have here in your paraphrase, mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. that in verse 19. Mm -hmm. Once again, folks, for those coming across this video, think about this. Jesus was a human being. Yes. Jesus is a human being. Yes. But he has been made into the immortal God. Yes. That's verse 23. So, so think about the image mm -hmm. you are worshipping every Sunday. Mm -hmm. That's right. Jesus would be horrified to think that his followers thought he was God, breaking the first commandment. So we've got a lot of work to do. But the conversation hasn't gotten started yet because those of us who know these things have not been frightfully activist. <laughs> if we're not activists, nothing's going to get done. So we'll go after it. Help us with this question then. Ask your local pastor. Report to us on the answer. What is this creed of Jesus in Mark 12, 29? Is that a unitary monotheistic creed? Or is it a Trinitarian creed? And just let them answer. That is a fascinating question that will yet change the world. So those are good comments. We do appreciate your interactions. Wonderful. Thomas then shows up as Adonis, Aphrodite, and so on. And the creeping things, I hadn't noticed that until Carlos read that thing in Romans, in verse 10 of our chapter 8, 
the creeping things, beasts and detestable things. Paul had that in mind when he condemned the pagan world of his day and invited them to become believers. Okay. And they're looking towards the east, are they not, in verse 16 here? Their faces towards the east, the sun, there's a sun worship going on here, obviously. We haven't read that. We haven't got to that, thank you. Let's go on a little bit more then. 14. 14. That was 14. That was 14. Weeping for Tammuz. Uh, the note in the Tyndale Bible, I recommended that, the Tyndale commentary on Ezekiel tells us to look in the New Bible Dictionary for details on Tammuz. So there's a lot of exploration you could have your children do, homework on all of this, to get into the pagan background. Okay, verse 15 says, I'll do 15 of chapter 8 of Ezekiel. He said to me, Do you see this, son of man? Yet you will see still greater abominations than these. Then he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the entrance to the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty-five men with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were prostrating themselves eastward toward the sun. Mm -hmm. Then God said, Son of man, do you see this? The people of Judah think my temple is so unimportant mm -hmm. that they will do these terrible things here in my temple. Mm -hmm. This country is filled with violence. If they, and, and they constantly do things to make me angry. Mm -hmm. Look, they're wearing rings in their noses to honor the moon <laughs> as a false god. That's an interesting translation. Mm -hmm. Whatever that means. What? Yes, it, it may not. It may be that that that'll do well. What do you have? There's much the debate. They are putting the twig to their nose, mm -hmm. and I wondered what that this meant. This sounds yes. better. Easy to read version. Yes. <laughs> uh, mine, mine says thumbing their noses at yes. me. That's probably oh, that's good. Okay. Whatever it is. I mean, some of the background here is a little obscure, but you can look at the Tyndale commentary for the discussion, and you won't settle all issues. But you get the idea. God is not just sitting back smiling at all. Verse 18, one more. Verse 18, click on. Therefore, I will deal with them in fury. I will neither pity nor spare them. And though they scream for mercy, I will not listen. Oh my goodness. So they cry in my ears, and you've got scream for mercy, mm -hmm. with a loud voice, yet I will not listen to them. Doesn't that put the fear of God in you? That's terrifying material. The point is that God is not this benign tolerant person that smiles down on everything we do and says, well, they're all really jolly good chaps. They're not jolly good chaps. They're the victims of the wrath of God. And that's the gospel of the kingdom. Repent, John the Baptist even said. Turn away from the wrath of God because the wrath of God is like the chaff which is going to be burned up. So you have two options in life. You either get burned up as chaff, not tortured forever, but burned up, destroyed, or you get saved. Either the barn where the wheat is taken into, or the bonfire. How about that? The barn or the bonfire. Write your local paper with that. Two choices. The barn or the bonfire. You make your decision. You either follow the massive paganized system we have, or you come away from that and get to the truth. Because without a passion for truth, you won't be saved. I, don't make any apology for mentioning that verse in 2 Thessalonians 2.10, talking of the Antichrist, where Paul is, pointing out that the Antichrist comes with every imaginable trick, false letters and miracles and wonders, all of that, and people who fall for that Antichrist, who don't take these things seriously, are losing their salvation, Paul said. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says, I'm using the Greek there. I hope some of our Greek-speaking uh, friends will like that. That's the way they pronounce it in modern Greek. Paul there said, because a passion for truth they would not accept in order to be saved. Wait a minute, Paul. You mean I have to have a passion for truth to be saved? Yes. Otherwise you're lukewarm. Worse still, you might have drifted into another environment where the pastor believes in the Trinity and preaches it. And you think that is fellowship? I don't think so. Be careful. Because a passion for truth they did not have in order to be saved. Then Paul went on to say in 2 Thessalonians 2, God gave them over to a spirit of blindness. It gets worse. All right, you don't want to have the truth? 
I'll show you what it's like to be blind. And now they are really set adrift, wandering like stars, wandering stars. So this issue of truth is very, very important. There's nothing more important, apparently, on those texts. Um, yes, what it's else? It's interesting, the worship of the sun. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where was that verse? 16. 16. Facing east. You know, mm -hmm. there are many, one of the earliest, uh, I'll put it on the screen here mm -hmm. for people, mm -hmm. uh, one of the earliest uh, depictions of Jesus yes. is, as, is as the sun god, S-U-N, yes. Helios, oh. the Greek god Helios. Of course. Of course. And Christ there, if you can see it, is seen with the famous, what later yes. was introduced as the halo. Yes. So when you see pictures, especially the Catholic mm -hmm. thing with mm -hmm. Jesus and he's mm -hmm. got a halo, that's a reference to the sun so, god Helios. Right. And that took over yes. the pictures of Christ, that thing around his that's head. Right. And there you see it, you see Christ on a chariot, Anthony, and mm. he's ascending, going up to heaven oh, yeah. as Helios. As Helios the Son. There's God. a good quote here from uh, Hugo Rahner. Yes. Dr. Hugo, Greek myths and Christian mystery. Mm -hmm. The result of the church's encounter mm -hmm. with the sun cults, yes. like Ezekiel is describing, mm -hmm. was nothing less than the dethronement yes. of Helios. Yes. Yeah, and Helios me. also reminds me of that other word, hell. Well, it's not related <laughs> to that <laughs> word, but uh, you're entitled to make Isn't all sorts of connections. Yes, of course it is, absolutely. So, so you turn sun, sun S O N, into S U N, and you've got it. That's what you do, the compromise with paganism. That takes us to one of our central themes. Compromise? The that's, that's not a compromise, that's a come in yeah, and yes, but take, it over, the and take over. Then don't forget that the church fathers said, we don't like this Unitarian creed of Jesus. It's too Jewish. We don't like it. We don't like the out and out paganism of the many gods of the pagan world. So what we'll do is to compromise the Shema and we'll say that God is three. Not three million, but three. But that is a mixing of Greek paganism. If you please read the introduction to my translation, you can get them free from the college even. We're getting rid of a surplus amount there, just free for the postage. And the quotes in the introduction are staggering to me, because historians know that the faith of the Bible was changed radically from the second century on. So most people sitting in church have no idea where their stuff came from. They need to read and study and have their children search this out. Question about verse 11 yes. from Michelle, mm -hmm. to go back a little yeah. bit. Uh, the 70 elders mm. of the vision, are, are the elders a, uh, the heavenly host, or are they the elders of yeah, no, the temple? They're the elders of the temple. Verse 1. Yeah, they're the elders in the temple. Heavenly host? Was no, there are 70 no. elders in heaven? Uh, in Revelation. In Revelation, in Revelation you have... You have elders, you have... Uh, seven? Not 70. Not 70. So, but these are not... This is not a vision of heaven, this one, I think. Right. They're people that Ezekiel knew. Standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel. These are human beings. With uh, Jazaniah and the son of Shaphan standing among them. Each man with his censer. They're doing this pagan worship right in front of Ezekiel. Poor old Ezekiel had a rough day having to watch all that. It says, um, Ezekiel went into a room frescoed with animal deities where the elders of Judah were worshipping. Yes. Others in Jazaniah's family had been faithful to the Lord under Josiah and Jeremiah. Okay. Good. That's a good note from the MacArthur Study Bible, is it? So the Ryrie. Ryrie. This a very good study Bible notes on some of these historical points. If somebody out there would write to John MacArthur of grace to you, a nice, polite letter saying... <laughs> Would you please define the gospel a little bit more clearly as the gospel of the kingdom? He almost gets there, but sort of hesitates, showing the eight kingdom texts in Acts, as I did in Dallas last week. And you might win a big fish with John MacArthur, who has a lot of good information to offer the public. He's actually good on uh, separation of government and the Yes, church. very good. Very good. Um, they're all... Uh, let's see. Williams. Uh, Daryl, First Corinthians nine. Mm. I'm not quite sure what this was in reference to. Daryl, uh, okay. nine sixteen. Let's see. Says, mm -hmm. uh, 
I have nothing to boast about and share the gospel because it's something I am compelled to do. That's very good. Oh, it might be uh, from the Philippians. No, no, it's 9.16. That's a very good verse. It's exactly applicable. Right. When we mentioned the, the people going out boldly mm -hmm. preaching the gospel. In yes. fact, it would be a disaster for me if I do not Absolutely. preach the gospel of the kingdom. Yes. If I'm doing this work because of my own choice, then I have a reward. But mm -hmm. if it were not my choice and an obligation was placed on me, then what reward do I have? Mm -hmm. It is the opportunity to preach the gospel mm -hmm. without charging for it, not demanding my rights as a worker mm -hmm. for the gospel. Absolutely right. I'm so glad you brought that text because that's the compulsion that we should feel. Verse 16 yeah. is exactly right. If I preach the gospel of the kingdom, I have nothing to boast of. I'm under divine compulsion. And that reminds you immediately, I hope, of Luke 4.43, which MacArthur doesn't talk about. Luke 4.43 says that Jesus said, I am divinely compelled. I'm under divine compulsion to preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's why God commissioned me. And I simply suggest that if you're part of the body of Christ, that same motivation as Christ sensed, must be with you. So Daryl is absolutely spot on there with that excellent verse, 1 Corinthians 9, 16. I am divinely compelled, I'm driven, obsessed to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Nothing to boast about, I'm under compulsion. Woe to me if I don't. My goodness. And the look, the look one is, why? Because I was commissioned. Yes, that's the great commission. That's the great commission. Of course it is. So again, write to John MacArthur, see if you can get some good answers from him. He has many good things, but he has an enormous influence. Andy Stanley would be another one. They don't quite get the gospel of the kingdom straight, but you can help them in a very gentle way. Okay, so we're back then in Ezekiel at the end of chapter 8. We should go into 9, right? It's a short chapter. Yep. Chapter 9, 1. Then he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Draw near, O executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. Behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, with which faces north, mm -hmm. each with his shattering weapon in his hand. And among them was a certain man clothed in linen, with a writing case at his loins. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Mm -hmm. Then the glory of the God of Israel rose from above the cherub angels where he had been mm -hmm. then the glory went to the door of the temple who's this glory and stopped when he was over the threshold then he called to the men the glory mm -hmm. wearing the linen clothes and the scribes pen and ink set yes he That's said to him walk through the streets the of jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of all those who weep and sigh because of the sins mm -hmm. they see around them that's very good. Five says, but to the others he said in my hearing, go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity and do not spare. Six. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little <coughs> children and women, but do not touch any man on whom is the mark and you shall start from my sanctuary. So they started with the elders who were before the temple. He said to them, Make this temple unclean, fill this courtyard with dead bodies, now go. So they went and killed the people in the city. Verse 8. While they were carrying out their orders, I was all alone. I fell face down in the dust and cried out, O sovereign Lord, will your fury against Jerusalem wipe out everyone left in Israel? Mm -hmm. Verse 9. Then he said to me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is very, very great. And the land is filled with blood, and the city is full of perversion, because they say, the Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. But as for me, my eye will have no pity, nor shall I spare, but I shall bring their conduct upon their heads. Mm -hmm. Eleven. Then the men wearing linen clothes mm -hmm. and a scribe's pen and ink said, spoke up. He said, I have done what you have commanded. Yes. All right, so you've got a marvelous demonstration <coughs> of God's character here, that he doesn't take evil lightly. 
And you have the glory of God in... Which verse was the glory of God? Verse 3. The glory of the God of Israel went up from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold. It's not a person, it's the glory of God. Is this it, the glory speaking, by the way? No, it's in, in verses 3 right. and... The glory of God can speak, meaning God speaks in his glory, something like that. Right. The, the cherub on which it had been so, is better than as you. Uh, to the threshold of the temple, and he called to the man... He called to the man that would be God, clothed in linen, at whose loins was the writing case. And the Lord said to him, okay, so you've got two different persons here, right? The Lord said to him, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. It would have to be an angel then, I suppose, reflecting the glory of God. The glory as an angel? Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. A personification, you're talking about glory as though it's another person. It's not another person. Unless it? it was, as you just said, an angel. Then it's an angel, an angel. right. Something like that, that's good. Or we have the Trinity there. Right? Yeah. Now the mark is very important in verse 4. Put a mark, seal those people, and you'll find that in the book of Revelation, the same idea exactly. Just go to Revelation chapter 7, and you've got a sealing in verse 2. Chapter 7, verse 2. This is an interlude chapter in Revelation, and you should be becoming, be becoming more and more familiar with the book of Revelation. Verse 2, I saw another angel, 7-2 of Revelation, ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice. Isn't the language very much like Ezekiel here? Crying out with a loud voice, very much the same. And what he does in verse 3 is, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God. You know why? Because the wrath of God is about to break loose before the wrath of God hits, we need to seal those who don't deserve the wrath of God. And won't get it. It's exactly that the thing in Ezekiel, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Seal them. It's, it's the, uh, then the question arises, well, who are these people being sealed? And you've got 144,000 of the various tribes of Israel. And in verse 9 of Revelation 7, you've got a great crowd of people. Couldn't count them. From every nation, Brits and Canadians and Australians, the whole lot. Nicaraguans, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. And so then John says, well, who are these people? He asks the question. And he gets the answer. They're the ones who have come out of the Great Tribulation. Notice 7.14. My Lord, Adonai, by the way. Adonai, my Lord. Kyrie, my Lord. Talking to an angel. You know, and he, the angel, said to me, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And they're doing well. So God doesn't pour his wrath indiscriminately upon everybody. Of course he doesn't pour the wrath on the bride of Christ. That's absurd. So they are sealed, marked with a tuff, that's the last letter, almost like a cross, you might say, <coughs> marked with a sign to keep them safe. So I see a mass of references to Ezekiel, in fact, if you looked them all up, you'd find hundreds of allusions, references to Ezekiel. <coughs> One of the most more striking is this marking with a mark of safety, if you like, a sealing. Is this sealing related to the Holy Spirit of Ephesians 1? Probably, yes. It would be the same it's idea, I should think, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of Not promise. The right. Yeah. The Holy Spirit of the promise, in the Greek there, the promise of the kingdom and so on, the promise that... Uh, Abraham would be heir of the world. That's the Holy Spirit of the promise of God which seals us. It's a good parallel. By the very, very good. Ephesians, right? This has nothing to do with the 144. This Revelation text teaches, right? Yeah, it's 144,000. Yeah, it's the 144. And the great, and the great. multitude. Jews and Gentiles, yes. So They're all sealed. And so there's a <coughs> definite parallel, I think, with the Spirit of God that seals all the members of the church now, of course. Yeah. Uh, Why not? Um, Same spirit. So is this like a separate uh, group? I mean, we're all... Well, the, the idea church, is, but... I think we're sealed now, the international Israel of God, that's the church of all the nations, are called the Israel of God in Galatians 6.16, the true circumcision, we're being sealed all the time as we come to conversion. Mm -hmm. But in the future, just before the wrath of God breaks loose, 
there will be another ceiling and he and these are people who will have come out of the future great tribulation mm -hmm. they have to go through it to be tried so somehow there's more special? No, they're chronologically people who are living at a time when the Great Tribulation will have hit, and they then come out of that and are sealed with the Holy Spirit and are therefore protected against the day of God's wrath. That's in in other thing. words, the same Same's standing Christian. as Christian. every other Christian. Of course. Because, you mm -hmm. know, the JWs yeah. make this a huge. Yes. They divide the yes. church basically with well, this thing. You can't talk about uh, this people. group in. Revelation 7 until you talk about the Great Tribulation. If you haven't got the Great Tribulation yet, you can't have people being sealed who have come out of it. So the difference is chronological. The principle is the same. Each one of us has to be sealed now. That particular group, 144,000 from the tribes, plus international group, numberless, very great numbers, they will become sealed then as they come through the Great Tribulation. And will come through it, and they will then to be spared from the wrath of God. The Rosellers, I think there's a lane in. Yes. Maybe the Rosellers. Sure. Not only has Jesus become an idol, yes, but increasingly he has become the only God. Yes. There is no God but one, and That's he right. is Father, Spirit, and Son. That's right. There is no God but one, and he is Jesus. Yes. This is from a quote from Nabil. Yes. yes. a Muslim turn yes. evangelical, I believe. Yes. Is, is that the one who died, uh, Elaine? I think he died recently of cancer. That's an excellent and comment from Elaine there. That gives us then the Jesus only movement. You see, those dear people of the United Pentecostal Church said, Well, we know God is one. We can see that. But we know Jesus is God. Uh, so he must be the same person as the Father. But ultimately, as Elaine points out so well there, Jesus has simply replaced God. Just to finish Not her thought, yes. uh, she says that this is a quite a shocking statement mm -hmm. that goes beyond Nicaea. Absolutely. Uh, which is a, a good point. Yes, good comment. point. It's a great point. Um, let's see. Could we say, this is Bob and Kay, mm. could we say the mark of the beast in Revelation mm. is a counterfeit yes. of Satan of the true sin? Absolutely. No doubt. Yes. Mm -hmm. The devil and his agent, the Antichrist, the final Antichrist, 1 John 2.18, the devil has a counterfeit system going. And so the Antichrist, in 2 Thessalonians 2, will be doing all of this in Germany in detail, he has a parousia. Satan is going to lay on a second coming fake one, parousia. And people will accept this fake parousia, he uses that very word, Paul does, accompanied by every imaginable lying, miracle, fraud. And if you don't have a passion for truth, you're going to fall for that. Uh, Ramon says, yes. does this mean that the rapture... Mm. Well, mm. he says this means the rapture of the church, mm. I guess you mean before the tribulation, is not true. Yes. We will go through the great tribulation if we're mm. alive at that time. That's a good question. We'll answer just like this. When you say rapture, in order for the conversation <coughs> to be clear, you must say pre-tribulation rapture, if that's what you mean. Resurrection, pre -resurrection. You must say pre-tribulation resurrection rapture. I don't believe in that, because Jesus never mentioned such a thing in Matthew 24. No, there's only one parousia, not two. It's not a parousia divided into two parts. That's impossibly difficult. And as to the Great Tribulation, you'll find in Revelation chapter 3, that the Philadelphia type of church, and those are churches typical of the moods and standings of various churches throughout the ages, those at Philadelphia, because they had stuck to the word of God, the gospel of the kingdom, they are spared going through the Great Tribulation, not by being taken to heaven, but by escaping. See, Jesus said exactly that. When you see all these things coming, head for the hills. The key to all this was the abomination of desolation, standing where he, Mark 13, 14, masculine pronoun, standing where he ought not to. If you're in Judea, head for the hills. I don't know what you do in Georgia. We'll have to find out later. But it's not by going to heaven in a pre-tribulation rapture, which is an illusion. It won't happen. Yeah, but I, it's by escaping. Yeah, not every 
the church as a whole will not go through well, the not, no those who don't need to be tried don't need to be because we're all over the place and that's, right. that's why jesus sends right. the angels to the four corners yeah. because we're all over the world right. but the tribulation can be more specific will be specific to the great the tribulation is centered certainly in the middle east not a worldwide event as such. i don't know it doesn't say exactly you never know but uh, Whatever the case is, some will not go through it deliberately because they have been faithful. Peter speaks about being tried if necessary. Some people will have shown by their devotion and dedication they don't need to be tried. Therefore they can escape, but not by being taken to heaven in a pre-tribulation rapture. That's the falsehood there. They can escape in their own house, if they say, in their own basement, by fleeing to the hills. Whatever that is, I don't know. I don't know, I think nobody knows for sure, the, the effect on, let's say, Haiti or, of the Great Tribulation or some far-flung island somewhere, I have no idea. The point is it's in the Middle East where the temple will have been rebuilt, where this Antichrist figure will be standing, and he's called the disgusting thing. When you see that abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to, in the temple with the article there, in Second Thessalonians 2, then head for the hills if you're in Judea. He didn't actually say what you do if you're in Fayetteville. So I don't know. So Christian, Christian persecution yes. as such yes. will not be a, a worldwide event as it is not now. I mean, Christians are persecuted in yes. certain parts of this world yes. right now, so the same will be when the Great Tribulation begins, we assume. No, I have no idea of the extent of it, but it's wrong to say that Christian persecution is not happening now. It doesn't matter where you are across the world, you start espousing these truths, you're going to get persecuted. So that's a standing order all the time. Different kind of, different kind of persecution. But no, I think there are some unknowns. Thankfully, we don't have every detail of this. It would be probably overwhelming. All I do know is that Jesus gave a sign of the Great Tribulation, which is separate from the persecution, tribulation we all go through. That's Acts 14, 22. Through much tribulation, we're supposed to enter the kingdom. That's not the great tribulation. The great tribulation is unique. Here's the way you do it. I'm going to do all this in detail in Germany with them. Here's where you deal, deal with this. There can only be one great tribulation. We need to be able to explain this to our friends. They have many questions. There's only one, the great tribulation. Can only have one unique, cannot, cannot have more than one unique tribulation. Jesus said it's a time which has never been and never will be again. That's in Daniel 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1. Once you establish that there's only one, the great tribulation, then you have to say, well, when is it? A number of people have been taught wrongly that it began in 70 AD. That's got to be wrong. I'll tell you why. Because it says that the great tribulation, Jesus said this, will be a time when pregnant women and women nursing babies are going to have a very tough time. That, I want to tell you, is not 2,000 years. So here's the crunch that you'll come into in all conversation about this. Matthew 24, 29, and the equivalent in Mark, says immediately after that great tribulation, the sun will be darkened and you'll see Christ coming visibly. Right? Is that clear? Immediately after. Now guess what? Immediately after, ask your two-year-old what that means. They will know. This forces the Great Tribulation into the future, immediately followed by the Second Coming. Don't let anybody tell you it began in 70 AD. If it did, immediately after is going to be at least 2,000 years later, that would mean that the Great Tribulation is going on right now, and it isn't. When we go to Olive Garden for a celebration, we go in and I say, by the way, this is not the Great Tribulation. And I'm coming against those people who think it is. Relax, it's not an easy time for anybody. I see that. But it's not the Great Tribulation. So we covered that, I think, well. And all comes out of Ezekiel, by the way. The sealing of those who don't need to be punished further with the day of the Lord. That's great. So Great Tribulation, Daniel 12, 1. Matthew 24, 21. Equivalent in Mark and Luke. Surrounding of Jerusalem by armies. That's the sign that Luke records in Jesus' great discourse. People say, well, I don't do prophecy. Teach me Christian living. What? Since you're on this, you must do it. Since mm -hmm. you you are on this uh, yes. thought, Luke 19 yes. is Brilliant. is not the 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 future, right? You believe that is a 70 AD prophecy? Remember the oh, the, the you're talking about Luke 19:11 or which one? Uh, 20. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, that I don't know. It, it doesn't matter. It's Where the Jesus same. sort of talks yeah. about. Yeah, it could uh, be 70 AD. Army surrounding and destroying the temple, but devoid of any yes. prophecy. Yes, that could be. It could be a 70 AD. It could be a 70 AD. That's possible. I was talking about. Um, there's a running conversation here at okay, on, good. online about idolatry. <laughs> yes. Uh, people who follow sports. Yes. Religiously, <laughs> addictively. Yeah, addictively. It could, yes. could be a form of idolatry. It could be. So there's this debate going on. Also, uh, Rosellers, I think that Christian nationalism, yes. America overall, yes. or do you mean America first? Yes. <laughs> anyway, is worst. Yeah. A pastor once said, quote, who was it? You didn't say who it was. If you are not supporting this president yes. and this war, you yeah. are not a real Christian. Yes. yes. I immediately walked out. Oh, so it was at a cop yeah. church, I guess. Okay. Or something. If you can name the person, please do. No, we don't need to know who that is. Very, very bad. Um, obviously. Omar said, maybe <laughs> not a typical American Christian who is patriotic, yeah. but a follower of the way, yes. Yes. If you mean the way, not in the no, not the denominational sense. Of course, we should honor the president, we should pay respect to all authorities and obey them as far as they don't tell us to do something that's against the will of Christ and God. That's very clear. But we are not, I repeat, not part of this world. I am a green card person here. I reside in this amazing country. I drive on the same wrong side of the road as everybody else does. And I pay the same taxes, but I'm not a citizen here. And so if they ask me to pick up a, a bomb and throw it at somebody, I couldn't do that. I don't think Jesus would. On one occasion, he said, go and get two swords. And people say, there you go. You see, Jesus was really military. They don't read the context there. Go okay. and get two swords and just finish the sword. Because there, Jesus said, this is so a prophecy is going to be fulfilled, that he will be reckoned as a freedom fighter. The Messiah will be reckoned as a common fighter. And so let's get a couple of swords for that prophecy to be fulfilled. And when they brought the two swords, Jesus said, joke over, that's enough, that'll do it. Well, Nothing whatsoever to do with going to fight wars in the world. Yeah, more specifically, he would be buried amongst uh, revolutionaries or terrorists. Yeah, sure. Because it's not actually thieves no. on the cross. There were insurrectionists. Yes, insurrectionists, um, absolutely. Uh, Dan says uh, mm -hmm. about this uh, idol thing and sports. Yes. Uh, by the way, Falcons suck. Uh, worship of something drives us to a place if it drives you to a place of priority, so if you prioritize, yes. put something above yes. God, obviously oh. that, uh, mm. Michelle says that sounded offensive. Um, <laughs> okay. My falcon suck thing. Yeah, it does. We, we will never down that Keep that language, that language way out of everything. Um, She's right. We spend, uh, uh, Michelle says that we spend a whole lot more time, money on our faith yeah. than we do watching our favorite football team. Well, that's, that's uh, some, good. some do. That's excellent. Um, okay. Yeah, good. That, that's verse, um, right. verse four uh, gives us a very important, I think, and practical mm -hmm. lesson in the sense that we are to weep and sigh because of the sins around us. Absolutely. Because all too often the thinking is that we are to um, not judge. And we are just to, uh, right. you know, accept and, and not judge. Nice. So this is so important that you don't even receive the ceiling unless you are weeping and sighing. Yes, and actively, I, I would say right. activism is mm. built in here, actively doing something That's a great point. against it. Which um, verse was that again? Put, on, Four. put Four. a mark on the forehead of everyone yes. who feels sad yes. and upset about all the terrible things yes. that people are doing in this city. I, has any is, other, is any other translation stronger? Sad and upset sounds awfully evil <laughs> to me. How's yours? Uh, sigh weeping. and sigh. Yeah, yeah well, sigh and groan. Cool. But weeping, we, weeping, weeping. I mean, yeah. and of course, it's the NLT, um, but folks. The, this, yeah. you know, we have to be weeping and sighing about the wretched uh, abortion that is going on around mm. us. Absolutely right, and don't forget the 250 million cases of medical drugs even, on Fox News this morning. 250 million cases recently of the overprescription of drugs which actually kills people. The opioid crisis is massive. 
That's not something to wink at <coughs> or smile at. So which was the verse about sighing and crying again? Get four. that. Nine yeah. four. Nine four. Thank you. The Lord said to him, "Go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark, a stamp, a sign on the foreheads." of the men who are sighing and groaning. That reminds me of the text there in Peter where he says that Lot was terribly grieved at what he saw in Sodom and Gomorrah. Terribly upset. Now Lot did some strange things himself, you can read the story, but that's a good point. If you are not visibly upset by the excess patriotism, if you're still waving the American flag or the British flag or the Australian flag, you are not there yet. Do not be military. Do not be involved in politics because you are not fully committed to Jesus if you are. Unless mm -hmm. God tells you to. Of course. And then we have here, right? Mm -hmm. Verses 5 and 6. Yes. Go kill them. Don't show That's any right. mercy. That's right. And you go do it. That's what Jesus will tell exactly. you when it says, bring my enemies before me. Right. So that's when that expires, folks. Yes. Just yes. because we're nonviolent now See, that's a good point. doesn't mean... God and Jesus right. himself will say to us, right. okay, now is the time. Pick up your weapon yes. and chop them up into little pieces. Yes. God is a God of vengeance. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, but you let him do it in his own time. So that's very good. Carlos there quoted from Luke 19 where it says, Jesus said this, bring my enemies in front of me when I come back and slaughter them. And the How many sermons have you heard on that? But don't do it now. For the, t for the time being, why not rather be defrauded, Paul said. Allow yourself to be cheated. He's appalled, Paul is, that they're taking each other to court as Christians. What? You must be kidding. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, about taking each other to court. Don't do it. Don't go to uh, court in front of unbelievers. Why not allow yourself rather to be defrauded? There's a place to do that. Interesting subject. Okay. Very good comments sir, from out there. I'm glad we have uh, stimulated some good Bible study. As I understand it, Bible study is interactive, ideally, and by this miracle of technology, we can hear what you have to say. And some of the comments are very, very instructive for the instructor, let me say. I've learned some things about the mark that I hadn't thought of even before we started this morning. So. Uh, if I could read Luke 19. The king yes. said to those who were standing beside him, take yes. the money away from him, yes. give it to the one who made ten times as much. They protested, but master, he already has ten times as much. Mm -hmm. The king replied, I tell you, to those who have, more will be given, but those who do not have, yes. even what they have, will be taken away from them. Yes. As for my, so this is when the king returns, yes. by the way. This right. is second coming resurrection mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. not Absolutely. now. Right. As for my enemies who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter or execute them in right. front of me. In front of me. Right. So Jesus wants to see his enemies slaughter. slaughtered in front of him. Okay, there's a new refrigerator verse. I don't think we want that on the refrigerator, but that's interesting. I've got that memorized now. That's 19 and 27. That's 3 times 3 times 3. Easy. All the 3's, 3 times 3 times 3. The 27th verse of the 11th cha of the 19th chapter of Luke. I've got it memorized. Bring my enemies in front of me and slaughter them in my presence. He wants to see it. Um, yeah. Just since we're on 19, I, I ask you this briefly, yes. but right. if you want to expound the, on, on the, um, the, I believe, prophecy here of mm. 70 AD. It could be. Luke 19, 41, I'll just run through yep. it quick. He drew near the city and saw it and wept. Yep. One of the few times he's recorded as weeping. Mm -hmm. Would that you, even you, had known on this day mm -hmm. the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden, hidden from your eyes. Mm -hmm. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you yeah. and surround you and hem you in on every side mm -hmm. and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, mm -hmm. and they will not leave one stone upon another yeah. in you because you did not know the time of your yeah. visitation, which is a very old, good Old Testament yeah. punishment. visitation word. God coming to find. That may well be a reference to 70, and that's why in Luke 21, he repeats some of the same material, but it's in that chapter is to do with the Great Tribulation and the Second Coming. 
Here he certainly refers to the destruction of the city, which did happen in 70 AD, so fine, why not? That would work well. That may then account for the fact that Luke mentions this no stone upon another twice, twice. in two different passages. Uh, Dan Shaw says, don't mess with the mad messiah. Right, don't mess with the mad messiah. Um, yes, right. It says here, uh, we should be a follower of the way, the yeah. way is through Messiah Jesus. Yes, it is. I always liked it when Paul mentions many times he is a follower of the way. That's Daryl. Yes. Uh, just letting them know that there is a way international. Which <laughs> right, that's a, a denomination. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Bob and Kay read it. I read an article by a minister about one of our greatest sins mm -hmm. is the sin of tolerance. Yes. yes. That's very good. Mm -hmm. It was Barbara's point. It's it's a really striking point. Judge not that you be not judged has been horribly abused. Paul said, "What have I to judge the world? But I'm judging the church." Paul said that himself. He was supervising the church, telling them where they were getting it right, where they're wrong. Apostle can do that well, but judge not means I'm easily tolerant of anything. I'm not going to judge. There's a place not to judge, but there is also a place to judge. Otherwise, you're just wishy-washy and vague. So if you want to read more on the violence issue, I recommend uh, rather, uh, maybe this is not a Christian thing to do. My own attempt at that was down at Bethany Seminary, where I had to write a thesis for my degree there, and I called it towards the cessation of church suicide, the strongest argument that I could think of, and maybe I'm wrong, you might want to read it out of sight, it's called towards the cessation of church suicide, was that in wartime, Christians always killed each other. What? By this shall all men know that you have love for one another, Amen. if you if love you each other, right? Kill each other. Yes, because I don't think kill. So there's some quotes there. I love the quotes because it was a Roman Catholic minister who blessed the pilot who took the bomb <clears throat> to Hiroshima. And he one day he woke up and said, what? Goodness, what am I doing here? I'm blessing the pilot that dropped the bomb on the nuns in Hiroshima. Yes, that was an aha moment, I hope for him. And I hope it will be for some of you out there listening to me today. Before you advocate the killing of other believers in other nations, you'd better be careful, because that isn't the sign of the church. I know that's a very difficult doctrine, I get it. I have the greatest admiration for people who give their lives to keep us safe. Huge. But I don't think Jesus was in the killing business this side of the second coming. That's my thought. But it's good that we can discuss these things openly. Alright, we're at the end of that, uh, are we at the end of chapter 9, more or less? We do two chapters. Yeah. So, Hopefully, so, God willing, we will take a couple of chapters. I do appreciate so much your interaction here. Very, very useful, very instructive for all of us. And thank the Lord God for allowing us this miracle of technology. Okay, we're going to finish with prayer. I'm going to ask Sarah if she would perhaps pray to close the meeting for us. And we wish you a very blessed week and hope to see you again next Sunday. Remember Theological Conference? Yes. Uh, you've got to... Come in early if you want hotel style. Yes, limited mm -hmm. space there. Good. First come, first but, serve. But unlimited space in the surrounding oh, area. Yeah. There's, al there's always, always space. space. <laughs> it's, yes. It's first. First come, first serve for those 24 rooms. Oh, hotel yes. style rooms, yes. Good. So please register early anyway. One. Just, just <laughs> please register. It helps us. It helps us. Okay.